Hey there, welcome back. Guess what? We've got another installment of our special limited series that we're calling Learn with Shopify, just for you. In these special episodes, we sit down in person with Shopify merchants as they share their secrets to success and how you can do the same. Hope you enjoy. Let's assume you are successful. In 10 or 15 years from now, how does your community look like? What are your companies? What kind of people are they employ? How do they compensate? Now that we know that, we can build innovation policy to get us there. Welcome to Learn with Shopify. I'm Benjamin Gottlieb. You know, we are in the middle of a workplace revolution right now. You can see it all across the globe. Folks are leaving their jobs, maybe that's you, and many are going out on their own, starting their own businesses, or making that side hustle their main one. Well, if you ask Dan Bresnitz, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If, and that's a big if, these new startups and ideas are being nurtured properly. If they're not, he argues in his new book, there are a litany of problems for communities, from a potential brain drain to an increase in wealth disparity, among many other things. Dan's book is called Innovation in Real Places, Strategies for Prosperity in an Unforgiving World, and he also currently serves as the Clifford Clark Visiting Economist at the Canadian Department of Finance. Dan, it's really a pleasure to have you here today. It's a pleasure to being here. You know, Dan, in your book, you write that Canada really does a horrible job when it comes to nurturing companies beyond this startup phase. Why is that? Uh, A, yes. I would say we're doing a horrible job, not just on that. We are amazingly good in invention, in coming up with great new ideas and great new research, um, and then really bad in uh, creating companies, jobs, and growth out of our own ideas. And the reason is? The reason is, first, our market structure. Second is with our private business sector. All in all, right, we are now talking from uh, headquarters of one of a very few exceptions, right, is really bad in doing R&D, research and development, engaging with anything that has to do with innovation. And as a matter of fact, it has been getting worse and worse, even with just engaging with new technologies, using new technologies for the last 20 something years. And if you wonder, Canada is the only G7 economy to be going down on this trend in the last 20 years. So we really are the winner of a wooden spoon in innovation. Well, let's get into that a little bit more in a moment, but I want to ask you about this topic, this issue you address in your book a lot, this dichotomy, the pull between innovation and invention. For folks who don't know, it sounds like they could be somewhat synonymous, but actually you argue that they're not. Can you kind of explain that a little bit for us? Sure. And, and, and it's really important because what we really care as citizens or residents of Toronto, we care about innovation because we care about welfare, a better life, better growth, better wages. We slightly care less about invention. So invention is if I'll take you back to the University of Toronto, we'll sit in my lab, we'll come up with a new technology. We might even do a prototype and get two patents. That's great. That's invention. Innovation happens when we try to, let's call it actualize, bring those ideas and the, you know, when the rubber hit the road, when we try to actually create product services or improved product or services or improve way we produce product and services or even how we service them in the economy. Uh, that's innovation. Um, and it comes from invention. It comes from ideas. But if you stop just when you have ideas, when you prove those ideas might work, but you never the one to actually make them work, you don't innovate. You know, Dan, when you talk about that, I think it reminds me and lots of people listening of a certain place called Silicon Valley mm -hmm. and all the representations, all the manifestations of that. Silicon Beach, maybe Silicon Hills in Austin. The New Yorkers might get upset with me. Silicon Alley in the Manhattan area, right? But you're not a fan of this Silicon model, are you? Not at all. And the reason is, especially if you look at the last 30 years, uh, once we had what we now like to call globalization, that particular model leads to growing inequality. 
And the way to think about it, and, and it happens not that in Silicon Valley, it also happened in places where we all admire, like Israel and Tel Aviv, the places that follow this model. And the reason is we are now producing stuff in different stages around the world. And what happened in Silicon Valley, we just do the first stage, like bringing new ideas. Only people that are employed in this stage are the geek elite, R&D engineers. So, you know, people like you and me, the graduates of the best universities, not the people you would really worry about. They're financiers, maybe a few celebrity chefs, you know, just visited your cafeteria. Um, nobody else. So those people get amazing wages. And worse of that, because we now focus with venture capital, on financial exits. And for those of you who don't know, financial exit happens when you take your company and either do an IPO, make it public, or even better for the venture capital, because then they don't have to worry about having a public company, sell it for a lot of money. And that's called a financial exit. The model of Silicon Valley now, if you want to be really cynical, is not to create a Shopify or Alphabet. It is to create as many companies that you can sell the industry is the creation and selling of companies, not of innovation. And in that industry, what happened is that people who finish MIT, UFT, Stanford, and Berkeley get unbelievable wages and a lottery ticket called stock options. But then there's the other 85% of a population, and the only thing they get is their house of pri the price of houses goes up, price of foods go up. Um, and the price of their wages go down. What's well, really interesting, and you brought up uh, Israel and Tel Aviv. I think when most folks think about Israel as a tech hub, they think of it as a success, right? I, I mean, I'm somewhat surprised to hear you say that you don't necessarily see all of it as being super successful for the people that live there. So Israel is a success. It is by far the most impressive innovation miracle we, the world, has known since, let's say, the 50s. It's a country that started as late as the 68, 70, having basically z almost zero people doing R&D uh, and almost no investment in that to the countries that right now looks even better than Silicon Valley in terms of VC per capita, number of uh, IPOs on Nasdaq versus per capita, everything. It's wonderful, apart from one problem. Because they focus only on that stage, because they are basically Silicon Valley on steroids, because the money is for it, um, they really focus on, on what they call themselves, which is startup nation. So the 15% that are involved in startup nation have a, the greatest life. They're doing well. Yeah, oh, they're more than doing well. The other problem is that everyone else doesn't. And if you look at what happened to Israel from the 70s, when it was the second most equal economy in the West, to now, where it's maybe one of the second most unequal, where five of every household, so like make it concrete, one of every five children in Israel is under the poverty line, meaning he or she does not have enough money to buy food at the end of a month. If you consider that a great success for all Israelis, then you and I differ about what success is. I don't think we do, but you're getting at this issue of wealth disparity, which I think if you walk communities where you do have big tech investments, San Francisco stands out, um, Los Angeles too. I think you can see this. I, I think you can see it on the streets. And um, it seems like you're advocating for a different idea, a different approach, one that you talk about somewhat in your book, perhaps not exactly like this, but an increase in public-private partnership, collaboration between governments and business. Um, how would you like to see that happen in a place like Toronto, for example? So I would, I would add one more thing. And the one more thing that I think we keep forgetting when we talk about innovation is indeed we have this like binary, zero or one, Silicon Valley or bust. In reality, as I said, innovation is all the way through from ideas to improved products. As a matter of fact, we don't do it in Zoom, but I'm sure everybody here uses Zoom all the time. And you and I remember that if 10 years ago we wanted to do this interview by teleconferencing, we were both- What a pain that would be. It would be a pain and would be unbelievably expensive. Sure. Now, everybody in their home just click like a light and Zoom is there. And that completely changed 
human welfare, especially after COVID. And that happens not because somebody invented teleconferencing, that happened 40, 50 years ago, but because we spend millions of engineering hours on improving video compression, data communication, CPU, everything. Until now, you click and it's there, and it actually works. And that's when you have welfare. Now take that and now realize that you need innovation all the way through to get there and take globalization and you will start to see that there are places that focus on different stage of innovation. So for example, in IT, since we're in IT and semiconductors, you might have heard about a place called Taiwan, even through you're from California, because sure have. it's the only place that actually know how to innovate in the production of silicon. That Silicon Valley that you mentioned no longer know how to produce silicon. Taiwan does. And when you see how Taiwanese companies work, how they compensate their engineers, what kind of jobs they create for people who are not just engineers, you will see that there is a very different models of innovation. Taiwanese companies, as we now know, are as innovative, if not more so than some Silicon Valley companies, but they innovate in a different stage of production, they create different kinds of jobs, the laws about how you compensate them are different, and Taiwan indeed has grown to become extremely successful, vibrant democracy, but also much more equal than what the U.S. has become or what Israel has become. And I'm assuming there's also uh, an increased involvement from the government of Taiwan in this creation of an environment that is benefiting more people. Is that right? Of course, uh, but in a very different way. So the government of Israel has been because it still does, extremely active in this miracle. Without the government, there wouldn't have been Israeli miracle. Without the federal government, there wouldn't have been any American miracle. Venture capital, which now you know, stride the street claiming that they are doing everything, wouldn't have existed without the changing of the laws that allowed them to be existed and a massive push of money from the federal government. Uh, but you can do it in different ways. And we need to open our eyes that the last thing we might want to have in Toronto is Silicon Valley North. Instead, we want want to be Taiwan. We might want to be Finland. We actually might want to be North Italy. There are many other models of how we can innovate. Well, let's speak about some of those other models. Uh, One of the other things you discuss uh, in your book has to do with the necessity of a startup or a business to take on risk right? And risk often comes with debt, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But you're actually asking for something that is quite interesting. Uh, In the book, you write that there should be some protections for businesses and startups that want to take on debt so far as perhaps if something fails, the government should secure that loan. Um, Are you saying essentially that businesses should be protected from, let's say, failing and reimbursed with tax dollars? I wouldn't say that there should be protect from failing, because if they fail, they get nothing. But instead, think about it as, as, as two things that are a problem with innovation. Let's start, because of that, Canada does really badly. And that is, innovation, by definition, is extremely high risk and uncertain. And I'll give you a few examples. First thing is, you don't know if your R&D project will actually end up with anything that works. And it might be also a lot more expensive than what you think. I I wouldn't say might. It will be more expensive. Worse, you finish it. You don't know if customers might actually want to buy it. And if customers want to buy it, you might find out that suddenly you're not allowed to sell it. All of those are things you can't really count for. So by and, and worse, without intellectual property, right, you know, Innovation is information. As soon as you've done something which is, you know, everybody wants to buy, you have multiple of imitations, so you don't get all the appropriation, all the money back, right, and all the profits. So you need to create, without creating a system that protects some of that, give you property rights, lower the uncertainty, lower the risk, um, businesses and individuals, uh, will find ways in order to make profit that are not as risky as innovation, and human welfare will suffer because we won't have new technologies, but we also won't have new drugs, new food, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why government intervenes. And by the way, the U.S. government is one of the most 
interventionist government in the world on innovation, no matter what the politicians will tell you. Okay? <laughs> now let's talk about debt. The real issue that I'm talking about is that we have become hooked. You know, people claim we have become hooked to Facebook, but we also have become hooked to a very specific model of how to finance innovation called venture capital. That model, as we discussed before, is a model that needs a financial exit in a very short time. Someone needs to be paid off for their investment. And, and quickly, okay? Because there's a way to pay off. You can give a loan and you get, you know, returns of that loan. You get a share of a profits. But no, here I put, a, I own a part of a company and the way I'm going to make money is by selling that company, okay? And that's important. Um, if you look at it from the point of view of a community, that's a problem for two reasons. Because the community that gives the public money, what it wants is that the company A to stay there and not move to Silicon Valley or somewhere else, and B grow and grow to the level that it creates jobs, not just for the R&D engineers. So you have to lower the risk with money, and then certainly to a level that it's actually sort of rational for people to actually innovate. But then you want to make sure that the company A, grow, and B, grow here in Toronto or Hamilton or wherever. And there are different ways of doing that. Um, and one of them is in that delay. You can't ever, in, in the way we construct the system, uh, prevent a financial exit but you can delay it to the level in which your company is big enough, growing enough, uh, produce a lot of jobs, you know, have a chance to become Shopify instead of yet another company that Alphabet just ate. So in a sense, give it enough time to become supportive of its local community. I'm chatting with Dan Bresnitz. He's a professor and author of Innovation in Real Places. Dan, we've been talking a little bit from a bird's eye view. 30,000 foot. Let's zoom in a little bit. I want to get back to this idea of the great resignation, people leaving their jobs, um, either leaving the lo workforce entirely or starting a company of their own. We're talking about millions of people in the United States that have been doing this. Uh, you're right now advising the government of Canada. There's all sorts of implications for this, right? There are tax implications if people are working for themselves and not a big company. Um, and I know, especially in this country, tax dollars, big part of what makes things go. What's the strategy right now about how to deal with stuff like this? What is clear, um, and what this particular government has admitted for the very first time in Canadian history, that we have a problem with a private business. The pri our private business sector, all companies in all sectors from agriculture to retail, just don't engage, we are afraid to engage in innovation or we don't feel it necessary because their profits are quite high. So you need to change it and you especially need to change it when all those people come and, and find different ways to work, right? Try to create businesses. This is a time in which if we play it right, if a government focus on the private business sector and help all those and would be entrepreneurs, all those would be or already small businesses to grow, we'll have a much better Canada. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out ways in which, uh, through different models, but um, one of them is the new innovation agency that was just announced, we'll find strategies that allow um, you and I in five years to celebrate seven, ten, 20 Canadian Shopify instead of one in, in every 20 years, one Canadian Shopify. And just for our listeners, I can tell you that we have not told Dan to be referencing all the success of Shopify. He's doing this on his own, uh, but it's it's true. I mean, I think, I think what you're saying resonates with a lot of people. So if you are a small business owner right now and you're looking to, I don't know, give back to your community in a way that you're describing is necessary to create the kind of innovation that we want to see. Um, perhaps this is a bit micro, but are there any suggestions you might have for some small business owners um, in that realm? So first, um, I would say that you need to innovate. And, and again, remember what I mean by innovating. I'm, I'm, it's not necessarily that you need to change your world with a new product or new technology that nobody heard about. 
but you need to find a niche. And in the book, for example, I'm talking about the cha- the fact that we all now use bikes and there's different bikes and everybody can do mountain bikes now. Bikes are a 200 years old technology and yet a Taiwanese company by figuring out how to use carbon fiber for the frames, suddenly could offer mountain bikes that everybody could use, not just athletes, okay? I Those loved, kind. Yeah. I loved your example of the uh, of the phone also that you read in the book, yeah, that if we didn't innovate on the phone, it would still be in a wooden box that'd be take you a minute to call someone, and now we have cell phones because of innovation, not invention. Exactly, and continuous innovation. By the way, when I bought the house in Toronto that we lived in, I still have that with the box in there, oh yeah, <laughs> on the wall. Just now to remind just... <laughs> me. <laughs> but you were talking about uh, in Taiwan. And the, yeah, like, so yeah. It, it, we, we need, and Canada really needs a lot more of those companies, okay? And, and by the way, they can, should be in all sectors. I mean, with all due respect to the United States, where I lived for many years and other countries, um, Canada is a resource-rich country. What really worries me is I don't see any innovation coming up from our agriculture and our resource industries. Um, So if I was an entrepreneur and I would say, I'm a Canadian entrepreneur, where can I conquer a niche that will make me a global player? It doesn't necessarily have to be in software. It can be in those industries. It's so surprising, though, Dan, because uh, this country in particular, Canada, is such an educated country. I think it outranks many other countries around the world in education, um, quality of life. I mean, how, how, how do you make sense of that then, that it's just, it doesn't quite make that jump? Again, you have to look at the way a private business work. When you look at how Canadian, if, if you want to be very simplistic, how Canadian deal with this uncertainty and risk, instead of of taking those amazingly talented human capital and put them to their full potential high-risk innovation, they say, oh, we have really, really educated people which don't cost so much. So we can use them to compensate to the fact that we don't even buy the latest technology. They'll be as almost as productive as American or Germans or whatever. A- and we can still have a very nice profit margin. So instead of really using the potential of of our workforce, Canadian businesses, by and large, saying, okay, we have very highly educated subsidy by the government, right, public education. Let's use them so we will have to take less risk. The way to think about it, if you like sport, is um, it's very easy now to see when you look at something called total factor productivity, not just whether businesses innovate or not, but how they use their human capital. So Canadian businesses right now are basically like the Maple Leafs in hockey, or maybe the Yankees for the last few years. They have the best players in the world, and then they put a coach or somehow the whole system, they just fail. Instead, I want us to become the Toronto Raptors, which seems to, no matter what group of players you give them, they win. And that's, that's where we fail. It's our private business. And, and I don't think it's because they're evil or stupid, right? They want to maximize profit for the lowest risk. But nobody showed them what does that mean to the society and the community in which they live long run. And Canada has been for the last 20 something years, like the famous frog, you know, that you put it, you put a frog in a pot of water and very, very, very slowly boil it. By the time the frog realizes it's dying, it's too late. But if you give it a, you know, a wave of hit, it jump away. We have been that frog that slowly dies. It's time we realize we're dying and changing it. Well, that's quite macabre, but it's a great uh, metaphor of um, what you're arguing in your book. I'm talking with Dan Bresnitz. He's a professor and author of Innovation in Real Places. Uh, Dan, let's end with this, if you don't mind. We have folks watching or listening from all across North America, but also all across the world. Uh, Shopify has that global reach. You almost argue for a decentralization of innovation in a way, right? Uh, Where you don't have to have this happen in the Bay Area or in a specific place. Um, So... If you're not in a tech hub or a business hub, what sort of advice do you have for folks that are trying to start a business and really trying to innovate with something? The way to think about it is the first thing you have to understand that we live in a global system. 
And in a global system, in every industry, you work in stages. There are places, what you call the tech hub, that focus on, on coming up with completely new ideas. And then there are places like Taiwan or Northern Italy, who says, that's a great idea, but you have no clue how to make it into reality. We will focus on innovation, making it into reality. And then there are places who say, well, that's a cool idea, but if you do it that way, or if you do it, produce it in that way, it'll be cheaper and innovate there. And then there are the places who, like Shenzhen, where there are places who really innovate on how you produce stuff, both services and products. Shenzhen and Southern China. Southern China. You need to understand, right, that global system, then figure out where you are, like what is your community, what things, if you innovate, can you offer the global system in your chosen industries or services? that will make you unique. And it does, the, it might even be that the last thing you want to do is the high end. Um, we have now seen it that, you know, Taiwanese companies, Japanese companies, Korean companies uh, are actually have more power than American companies in the industries that supposedly American com uh, companies created. Well, I think one of those examples would probably be, you brought it up earlier, the uh, semiconductor chips and the issues we had in the United States, and I would imagine here in Canada too, with getting cars when we had a chip shortage. Cars, refrigerators, everything, because everything now has a semiconductor in it. So are you saying that should be made here in Toronto? No, I don't think that semiconductors should be made here in Toronto, but... What should be? What should Toronto be good at? Toronto, there's two different, it's, by the way, just to realize, it's two very different questions. Um, because what Toronto should be good at and what Canada or other places in Canada, that's a completely different answer. Okay, so what you can say what Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal maybe should be good at. And then maybe they should be in the high end, right? Quasi Silicon Valley, but in a, using different models, so it wouldn't be just R and D engineers. But Canada is a huge, very diverse country. By the way, the United States is the same, and it is time that places have different visions of where they want to be in ten or fifteen years, and reach there using innovation as one tool. So, I'll, I'll tell you what irritates me when I go to places that says, you know, here, you're a famous professor, come help us to uh, work our innovation. And I said, okay, excellent. Let's start. So um, you say you want to be innovation-based Seattle or whatever other city. Uh, what does that mean? And then instead of telling me what they mean, they said, oh, we need more VCs. We need more patents. We need." I said, no, 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 no. Let's have a more pragmatic vision. Let's assume you are successful in 10 or 15 years from now. How does your community look like? What are your companies? What do they give the global markets that the global markets want? What do they need from the global markets? What kind of people they employ? How do they compensate? Now that we know that, right, we, we have on our map where we want to get we can build innovation policy to get us there. If you tell me that what you want is, I want more science park because I want to be the Silicon Valley of the North, it's basically like going into a very stormy sea with no map and no campus or GPS because we live in this area. You'll get lost and you'll be drawn. Well, Dan, you have a map. It's in your book, Innovation in Real Places. And I should also remind our listeners and our viewers, Dan is the Clifford Clark Visiting Economist right now for the Canadian Department of Finance. Dan, what a pleasure it has been. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I hope to see you again soon in Canada.